Hello. It's always a surprise, but this is, uh, well, I'm Bill, and this is How to Diorama with Scale Monocraft. So thank you very much for coming in. And it was funny, I'm I'm watching like this little countdown clock, you know, for where you go live and stuff. And Mark comes in and says, hi, Bill. And I'm like, oh, I need to do that. And it's kind of like, you know, when the weight person comes up to you and your mouth is full. And I'm not dogging you, Mark. It was just funny to me. It, it, it struck me as that. And and hello, and thank you very much for coming by, Mark. It's really cool to see you. Uh, John, John is here. Thanks very much, John. It's great to see you as well. If I Could Paint is here from the UK. Thank you very much, for If I Could Paint, for coming by. And um, uh, Go For It Painting even sent me a, a deal this morning that uh, they were going to make it. So thanks very much, uh, everybody, for making it on. Um, I'm pretty excited today because I had a really, really cool week with painting in oils and, and a bunch of other stuff on Ichiro and on Carlos. And um, today we're going to do live demonstration. And one thing that was really, really cool is something that somebody had suggested uh, previously. Um, I tried this last week and it worked like phenomenally. And, and I'm going to show you how I use that suggestion and uh, in the live demo today. So that'd be the first one. We've got two. So holy cow, I'm like spraying here. Sorry about that. Uh, Scott's here. Uh, thank you very much, Scott. That's really cool that you could make it. And Mark, he's given me the thing. Thanks very much, Mark, though. I was kind of funny. I thought it was fun. Um, and thank you so much, folks, for, you know, showing up. Uh, I, I know it's Friday and, and some of, you know, some of you guys are working and um, it, it's really fun to be able to spend some time with you on your on your lunch hour. If you're re-watching, you know, it's it's really cool for you to be here, too. So thank you very much. I've got better juice today. This is uh, lemon and water and um, honey. So hopefully I won't have any coughing fits. I've just got a weird thing when I talk constantly. So let's take a look at this because I'm pretty happy with some of the pictures I was able to go and show. So I am going to um, present this. And I think it's pretty cool because what I was able to do was do a little bit of work on the oils and stuff. And while I was having those oils dry, because the oils kind of have to, you know, you, you, you do this thing, because I'm new to oils, folks, right? And so you put them on cardboard, and by putting them on cardboard, it leaches out the, I think it's linseed oil in the, um, in the paint. And then it's going to dry a lot faster, which is great. So that's one of the things that I did. Hey, Eric is here. Thanks very much for coming by, Eric. I, I got to get my mouse over there. How's it going, Eric? Thanks very much for coming by. So when I'm doing this, um, I'm putting on the oil and I'm mixing it with, I use Mona Lisa mineral spirits and it, they're really good. Um, they were suggested to me from another person and they go on really nice. And it makes the, it makes the oil super smooth. You know, you you kind of thin it out with the Mona Lisa oils, and and it just makes it really smooth when it's going on, and and I'm pretty happy with it. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is we'll look at the oil painting, and then the first live demo is gonna be the toe strap, and and I'm kind of hanging on the toe strap because I'm kind of hoping that John um, Hayes will come in because I used John Hayes question. Uh, to, to build the toe strap. So that's that's kind of why I'm dragging my feet here, but uh, we'll get into it here in just a second. So we're going to look at a little bit more of uh, oil painting on Carlos. So this is what I came up with. And I'm going to go like big screen here because I want you to see the whole deal here. Um, I spent, I would say, you know, a week and a half on chipping. And, and I think I talked about that ad nauseum, so I don't need to go back into my chipping excursions. But I, I really had a good time with it, and I, and I really went as, as deep as I thought I possibly could. And so when it came to the oils, I, I was thinking that I would be doing streaking. And what I ended up doing was really tones, and, and it was really changing the different, um, like, like around the rusted out parts and stuff like that, the area that I chipped by using 
uh, a little bit of ochre, it just kind of changed the tone of it and made that transition from the chipping to the paint a lot nicer. It, it, it seemed like that it, it had a better look to it to me. So that's kind of what I did. So I did that. I did one day. I let it dry. I came back. I did another day. And I, I'm pretty happy with it. I, I, I did pretty extensive stuff. So I did, you know, oils over the entire model or the entire kit, I should say, you know, the raccoon. And then the second day, I kind of varied it a little bit more. And I think that's really apparent here. If you look um, maybe towards the back of his suit, you don't see a lot of that um, kind of ochre tone. But on his helmet right there, you can. And up here in the upper part of that, you can see where that ochre is on the paint and it, and it changes it quite a bit. And I really like the effect. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it came out. Then down here, I, I was really happy with what it did on the red. Uh, I think I was able to come in, put a little bit on there. I, I used some black uh, oils to almost do some wash. And, and that filled in some of these areas around that red ring. And, and I'm pretty happy with how it came out. So now when I, I kind of look at it, though, I was thinking I was going to do streaking. I thought that's what I was heading to do. And so I didn't get that out of it. Um, it still needs some like dust, right? Because these guys are walking through uh, basically a desert on a planet. So there's going to still be a lot of dust. And I've got the dry pigments to do that. But this did give me the tones. There's still, you know, the chipping is still bright. It's real crisp but I think it's got a better overall tone. So it looks to be the same stuff, maybe homogenous. Is that the word? So I think maybe that's what I'm trying to think. You know, it's, it's a little bit more even all the way around. So I'm pretty happy with it. So now we're going to talk about Ichiro real quick. And I did, uh, you know, a few things, and this will be a nice little segue into the toe strap deal. Uh, because what I did here was I built this toe strap. And the reason was I thought as I, as I went and I'm probably going to skip ahead a little bit here. Um, here is the cargo net that we did last week on the, all the stowage on the back of Ichiro. And the whole issue here was when I got all that on, it looked like there was a lot, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of weight. And it's, I, I still don't think it's all that much weight, but it, it, it certainly could be over the wrong terrain. So what I thought was it would be a good idea to have this toe strap attached to the front of each row so that, and, and if you look over to the left of the picture here, and I don't know if the next picture is a little bit better here. I put then some chain and a little little lanyard on the back of Carlos so he could hook the toe strap to the back of him. And when they get in like an incline or or some uh, terrain that it's hard to maneuver over because we only got this little tiny wheel for each year, of course, um, then he can help pull the load. And I, I thought it was a nice uh, thing to add. But what I didn't expect is I would like the toe strap so much. Um, I don't want to go yaya -ya over just a toe strap, but I really like this toe strap. And I made it out of just the same kind of cloth that I, I, I've shown, I think, previously. And we're going to look at it here today. But I used the technique that um, it's not John Harris. Gosh, darn it. Um, but one of our, our, our guys, and I know his name, I just get weird when I'm online. I get just dumb in the head, but he suggested using the 50, 50, um, Mod Podge and water to go ahead and put on stuff to see if it'll stiffen the cloth or maybe stiffen some of the stuff that I'm working on. And I said, no, I typically would use, um, like a starch or, uh, sizing. And that's what I've used up to this point. But guess what? It works great because I used his idea. And um, I'll show that, you know, here in just a little bit. That's our first demo. So Eric says the cardboard helps remove the linseed oil, which it in turn allows the oils to dry flat and not shiny. There you go. That's perfect because, yeah, they did dry flat. 
Um, they did dry overnight. And, you know, I really like the look of it. It didn't add, you know, like a bunch more drying time. I've only done it a couple of times and, and I'm super happy with it. Thanks, Eric. I really appreciate that. So I think we are at the end of those pictures about, and then here is the, um, uh, just other pictures of the cargo net and down below here on the cargo net, what I wanted to show you is I put a couple of tanks, see those, the, the yellow and the red tank. Those are things that I added because I didn't think we had enough fuel either for Carlos or for Ichiro to get where they needed to go over a four year span. You know, if these dudes are walking for four years in, in basically a deserted, you know, planet um, there's two encounters, you know, so there's like some refuel stops that can work, but I needed like a highly concentrated fuel for Carlos, something to eat. Um, I also needed some type of a fuel for Ichiro and that's what the gray kind of roundish container is up there. And that's what, you know, brought on this whole deal with the cargo net. So I, I love how this all came together and, you know, uh, I think I showed you on these um, on here, there's like a little nozzle back here on one of the tanks. That's so that he can access it, you know, and, and it's like supposed to be a highly concentrated food source for Carlos. So, you know, he's cool. He can, he can get where he needs to go and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the other one is for Ichiro. Now, the only thing that I think I didn't accomplish here is I love the cargo net, but when you're looking at it here, it looks way too new. Now, the rope inside there that he's carrying, it's a little different color. That's totally cool. But this cargo net looks way too new. And I'm not sure who said, but somebody uh, made the comment last time when we were talking about the cargo net, should it be... Um, you know, like aged or something like that. Yes, it absolutely should be aged. So that's one of the things that I'm going to be doing is aging that so that, you know, it looks a little bit more appropriate. It's been on this super long journey. And, and, and that I think is really important. Okay, so I think what I want to do now is get to our little demo because I've got my other camera here trained on the area that I can show you and I'm going to make a toe strap and I think it's a pretty cool deal. So let me show you this here. I am going to change the camera and I am going to bring in the material that I was talking about previously. And um, I'm going to change my camera angle here just a little bit. Sorry about that folks. But what we have here is just some, plain muslin and this plain muslin is the only thing I did with it. And sorry, I'm going to go ahead and change the picture here. The only thing I did with it is I took some of the 50 50 cut of Mod Podge and water. And I took some of this, I, you can kind of see these, uh, these fold lines. I rolled it up. I sprayed a little bit or didn't spray. I just dribbled a little bit on this. I did not sop it wet. It wasn't dripping. And then I rolled it up and then I kind of patted it in so that it did get some of that everywhere. And look at this. It's really nicely formed. And I think it has, I'm going to bring this out a little bit. I think it has a really nice, you know, you can see all the texture, but it's really workable. And that's what I think is really important about this. I can do something with this and it's stiff enough instead of trying to work with something that's all flimsy. So when I made the toe strap, and I'm going to show you the toe strap here real quick. When I made the toe strap for Ichiro here, what I, I figured I wanted to do was have a, something that looked either like it was sewn, like a normal toe strap would be, but heavy and thick enough that you would find it like an industrial like uh, weight toe strap. So I used two plies of it. And to do that, 
I'm going to use, you know, this tool again. Now I've talked about this previously and, and I really think that anybody that's doing craft would have um, a use for this kind of tool. Uh, if you're doing dioramas, certainly. So any kind of fabric you're cutting, any kind of even paper you're cutting to get a really, really straight cut, this works great. So what I first did was I took this after it had been, um, uh, you know, soaked with the 50-50 cut and I just hung it by a couple of clothespins and it dried in the shop. After it dried, I just took it down. I took one end of it because it was a little tattered. I took one of it and then cleaned it off. This kind of comes out and now I can do a cut and I cleaned off the end, but now I'm just gonna do a little, it's about a quarter inch wide strip and see how easy that cuts. And it cuts it super clean. So those edges are super clean. They're not fraying whatsoever. It's not necessarily a bad thing if it frays, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but we want really clean stuff right now to be able to work with it. And I'm going to get two of them. These are about six inches long. And, you know, they don't necessarily have to be exactly the same, but they're darn close. Okay. So now that I got two of these guys, what I want to do is create those little wire connectors. I'm going to tighten this up a little bit more and show you and talk to you a little bit about wire. So when I'm, when I'm working with wire, there's a few things I want to be able to do. Number one, it, I, I want to be able to form it the way I want to form it. But after I've done, you know, forming it, I want it to stay where it's at. And so the type of wire that I choose is, is critical for that. The secondary consideration is, is it's going to hold paint. Because what I did earlier is I used some wire that I didn't, I didn't do anything to ahead of time, and it didn't hold the paint as well as I wanted it to. So here's a, thing, uh, a couple of things to consider. This is 20 gauge wire, and a lot of the times what I'm looking for is the gauge, the gauge being how thick it is, right? And so that's about the thickness I wanted, 20 gauge. So I'm looking around 20 gauge. There are charts online that you can see what the millimeter and what the inch equivalent to that is. So that's a 20 gauge wire. This is copper wire and copper wire is great because it's pretty pliable. Okay. Um, this is raw copper wire. So the outside is smooth, but it doesn't have any coating, which is really nice because you don't have to worry about something else to interfere with your paint sticking later on down the road. This is the same kind of thing, but this is called dead soft. Now, this is great if you're, you know, doing something that you're going to bend a lot. And so that's a fine wire. But after it's been bent, it's not necessarily going to hold the shape if there's any kind of load on your wire. So you want to be careful of that. That's called dead soft. I needed dead soft for what I was using, but I don't want to use it for this application. So that wire is out. This is another one that's pretty common, and this is floral wire. And I like floral wire. It's very malleable, meaning it's pretty bendy, you know. You can get it in different uh, thicknesses. This one is 22 gauge, meaning it is a little bit thinner than the 20 gauge. The higher the gauge, the thinner the wire. Um, and the other thing that's nice about this is it has a plastic coating. Now, that's good and bad. I wouldn't just paint the plastic coating because it has a little bit of a, a, a feel of it. Could be wax. I'm not sure. So I would have to strip the outside of it. The other thing is, is, is that plastic or whatever that coating in there going to interfere with a lacquer paint or some kind of paint that I'm going to put on it? Is it going to hold the color? The other thing is it's awfully colorful. So I have to cover that up. So I got to put on a lot of paint. So that's something I, I do like using this. I'm not going to use it for this application. Um, the other one, and I think this is a great application for this, um, is dark annealed steel wire. So now I've kind of got down between these two and, and, and I'm looking at a couple of different things here. Number one, the steel wire is steel, right? Over time, it could rust. So that's a biggie. I got to be careful of that. Um, but it is annealed, meaning that it has 
been softened by heating and then let naturally cooling. When you heat a metal like this and just let it naturally cool, I'm sure there's a lot of other scientific stuff going on there. But what I know about it is you heat it up, you let it naturally cool and it anneals it. Also change the color. It, it, can, it can realign the molecules in it to soften the steel. And as long as you let it, you know, slowly cool in just in the room temperature, it'll remain annealed. And that's what this is. Um, it's also got a little bit of a rough surface. It's a little bit dark in color. I use this a lot. I really like it. The negative being is it could possibly rust. So I got to be careful. I don't want to embed this in something where I'm going to have water or even acrylic paints. There's water in acrylic paints. So I want to be careful if I'm using any kind of water-based Mod Podge. Mod Podge has water in it. It could interact with this. It could rust. The rusting of this, integrity, not a big deal. It's the um, oxidation and that rust color that could bleed through stuff. So thinking about this one again, I'm not going to use it. This is the one I am going to use. Now, this is solid wire. It is um, a little bit soft. It's the gauge I like. It's copper. It's not going to uh, rust. It can still oxidize. That is a fact. But I've used it enough. It's, it's worked great for me in a lot of applications. Now, this is a little bit soft for the application I want to use. I want to make a couple little buckles right? So, uh, or, or not buckles, but just fasteners that we're going to use on our toe strap. So I'm going to use it, but what I would typically do is I would shape it the way I want. And maybe I'll just show that shape it the way I want, heat it up and then dunk it in water. Now, when you dunk it in water after being very hot, then it does a different chemical reaction with the molecules in the steel and it makes it very hard. It also makes it very brittle, but that will make it hold its shape a little bit better if there's any kind of a load. I don't want it to, you know, bend over time. Okay. So we're going to do that. Now, the tools that I use, I do not use absolutely, please. This stuff is pretty soft. You think, ah, oh, heck, I'll just use my regular nippers. Don't. It's really, it, it's not about, um, you know, nippers are meant to go through plastic. It's just that simple. Let's keep this to a separate pair. So I've got myself, these are called flush cutters, same kind of thing. You might even use these for plastic, not a problem, I have, but they're a better. Um, and so that's what I want to use for this. So I just clip off a little bit. I don't need a heck of a lot. And then I've got a couple more choices that are nice to, to think about. And that's the kind of pliers that I'm going to use. Now, this one is specialized. It's really kind of cool. It's got round little jaws out there. And so if you're doing something in the round, this is fantastic because I can grip that there and I can get a really nice radius on my wire because I'm going around that. These are really nice because they're tapered and that tapered works really, really well because I can go in here and if I clamp down on the flat, I bring it around the round tapered part I've got a D and D's are great. I, I'm sorry, it's, it's hard to see that, but it gives me a D shape and that's fantastic for what we're gonna use. Now, uh, there's, there's a lot of other ways to make, I made triangular wings and that's what I'm gonna show you today, but that's what's nice about this. Now, this one is nice and this I would use if I were using like the steel wire, because these are meant to cut through a little bit heavier wire. So it's got a cutter there, but it still has that taper. And I do use this uh, a lot when I'm doing rungs because there are little serrations in the jaws there. And it's almost like a stepped guide for setting. I'm sorry, it doesn't show very well, but it's almost like a stepped guide for doing rungs like on the side of a tank. So that's why I use these and they're just perfect for that. You, you put it in there, you bring it over each side and you clip off a, a perfect little rung for the side of your tank. So, uh, but for this application, what we are going to use are these guys. And so I'm just going to straighten this out. If you get a kink in your wire, it's real easy. You just go back to the base. It's got a flat spot, grab it. You can flatten it out pretty good and you're ready to go again. So not a big deal. Uh, to make these, uh, just to make it simple, I uh, am gonna use one of them on one side, it's gonna be a D-ring. And you see how I did that? I've got a flat 
uh, it's as tight as I can make it, but I've got a flat to make a D, but it joins at the end. Not the best kind of a joint. Typically, you want the joint to be on the flat midpoint. So all I do is, and I'll try to get some tighter shots of these later on and post them, folks. I'm, I'm real sorry about that. I didn't think about that part of it. But I just grab the wire about midpoint of the jaw and see it makes a, a kind of a, a smaller D. I'm going to try to get up close and see if that will resolve. See there, the D is made, but the D is not complete. But that's what we want. Now I'll go in on the other side. I can clip it back. I, I can just estimate how much I need. And then... I can go on the other side and bring the other side of that in. And I've got a really nice clip then or um, like attachment for my, for my toe strap. So that'll be on one end. Now the other type and, and what I like to do is triangular and, and that's a little bit different. And so what I'll do is I will cut a little length about a half an inch long man i've got a i'm sorry it's just not focusing well i thought i had this all figured out uh but it's about a half an inch long and then what i'm going to do is i'm just going to take about a sixteenth of an inch on either side those are going to be the pieces that are going to be inside okay and so i make just basically a u shape let's see if you can see that like a U shape, okay? Then I just go in the middle of that and I make one single bend and bring those two ends together and I've got a triangular piece that will now go into our buckle, our toe strap. And, and that it's nice, you can have one on one side, one on the other. Now the other thing that I like to do is I try to make some restraints um, or things that are gonna, they basically, I'm gonna uh, go back to a picture here and show you where that's at. Cause I think you can see it a lot better here. Here are those triangular rings you can see that there, those little triangular rings there, those will, um, uh, that's what I'm making with the triangular ones. And I just think those are great. Below that right here is what I'm going to make next. And, and those are just little uh, slips that, that help hold the, um, help hold the extra fabric that you're going to put through there for the strap. And those are just simply by making a couple of loops and then clipping it off. It's real simple. So now I've got three little hooks. And to work with this, I'm going to use a little bit of the Mod Podge. Let me switch the picture back. And so by going back to our um, Mod Podge, I don't want to go crazy with it. And the reason is this. I used Mod Podge and water to get these things stiff. So I've already got Mod Podge and water in there. So I want to be careful because if I put too much on the strap, I, it'll just go limp again. So I'm just going to be real conservative and I'm going to think how I'm going to do it. Number one, I'm going to fold the end in here and here on either side. I'm trying to get better picture here. And that's where my buckles are gonna go. So I'm gonna take the first one, or actually the second one I made, the triangular one, and we'll just slip that in there. And you're trying to make sure that the 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 little buckle you know the little end attachments you made will fit this one was a little bit tight but it's pretty easy to bend it and so i'm just going to feed that in there 
and loop it over at that fold point. I'm gonna I'm gonna get a little bit more length on my fold. I got that in. Then remember this, this is the little thin, this is just to hold this stuff down. And, and I think it looks a lot better than just the buckle on there. So I'm gonna take that from the other end. And when I'm, I'm doing both of these, I'm only gonna do one for our demo. When I'm doing both of these, I'll have two of these and I'll slip them both on the same time. But I'm just slipping that over the other end and running that down, you see? And then it'll go over just like you would on a regular strap. And it just kind of dresses it up. It looks a lot nicer by having that on there. Once it's where you want it, you, you can also kind of crimp it. And that'll help keep it there. Okay, I'm going to use it with this one. There we go. So now that's crimped. Now we're gonna use our other one, our D style, and we're gonna put that on the other end, and then we're gonna fold that in as well. And here's where I'm gonna apply just a little bit of the Mod Podge and water underneath these, not too much, because I just want it to hold it down. There's enough glue and water already dried that it wants to stick pretty readily. Right, it's almost like pre-gluing something. So once that is put on there, and I know my hands in the way, I'm gonna move it in a second here. Once that's on there, I'm just kind of lining these up. You know, these ends, you know, you want to make sure that they line up because you don't want a thing anything to stick out. And then the next thing I'm gonna do, and these are my little um uh fly tying snippers that I really, really like. I'm going to cut a piece because I want everything to be even. I want an even thickness. And so I'm going to cut this to go in between these two ends that I clipped off. I'm going to put a little bit of Mod Podge and water in there. It doesn't take a heck of a lot. And then I am going to stick down that piece. And that's just going to even it up. You, you know, you don't have to do that. I, I think... You know, these toe straps, they're going to be uneven typically, and that's okay. I just wanted mine that way. And then I'm going to take the other piece of that. It's a little bit long. I'm going to clip it down a little bit. And I'm going to put that there. Okay. Uh, still a bit long, sorry. I want to adjust it so... The inside and the outside look like one continuous piece. And the reason is later on, I'm going to um, paint it and I want to paint it without it being um, a bunch of seams. Because then if you're painting like what I did, a stripe or a line, on those seams, it uh, you have to either match the line on either side of the seam or you have to offset them predictably. That's just the way I want to look at it, you know. So a little bit of glue and I stick them together. And then I want to leave them and let them set up for a little bit. By leaving it and letting it set up a little bit, what it's going to do is it, it, it's going to kind of wet the, the, the moisture is going to get through the other fabric. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and, and this is how I did it, I wanted it to have a little bit of a, a, a loop uh, in it. You know, it's hanging down. You may want your toe strap doing something else because at this point, what I would do is I would flip it over and this is how I would apply it to my diorama or my model. And I would paint it in you know, with all the contour and the texture you want painted in with your Mod Podge and your water. Once it dries, it's going to be completely solid and, and, and paint it. If you, if you just let it completely dry here, it's going to stay straight. It, it's not going to want to, it's not going to want to be as pliable once it dries. So I would suggest definitely, um, at this point, you put it on your model. What I did was I just looped it 
and and I haven't done the the final bit of of Mod Podge yet. I looped it like this, and because of the stuff that I stuck together previously, I was able to hang something from those two loops, and it gave me the nice loop you see here on on Ichiro. If I can get it in the camera better, yeah. So that's how I did that. Um, I'm going to switch because this was obviously a terrible idea. I, I think I'm going to present well, and it just always is a train wreck. But uh, let me go back to here. There we go. And then I have pictures, and I think the pictures are probably better. Now, later on, I have tested that, and when we do the surface demo, that'll work good. It's just like different colors and stuff like that. It's not so minute. It'll look a lot better because we're going to do the surface demo here in just a minute. Um, so anyway, that toe strap, I think came out great. Um, it, it was able to, you know, I painted it, um, and I put like the blue stripe. Sometimes you see like a, a red stripe and I don't know what that red stripe or blue stripe is. Maybe you can see if it's partially severed because it's easy to see if it's torn. I don't know, but, um, I love it. I think it came out great. The sides of this, when I start getting more of the Mod Podge and water on it, I can then kind of, you know, pull away of the fiber a, a little bit, you know, with your, with your tweezers. And if you want it worn or you want it to look like it's got a little bit of wear to it, that works great. Now, once it's done, it's a full paint job. I mean, when you know when you make something like this, it looks really neat. I, I mean, I think it looks really neat and, and it looks pretty real. But it still has to have a full paint job. I, I painted it. I weathered it. Um, I highlighted it. You know, so it's just just like anything else. you got to take it for the full scope. Like I was talking earlier about the um, uh, the cargo net looks too new. I got to go back and I got to get some wear on it and I've got to paint it. That cargo net needs to be painted. So I've got some comments here. I've been really ignoring everybody and I really didn't mean it, but um, here we go. Uh, and Mark, I saw, and I, I think we said hello to Scott. Thank you very much. And Matt Brew Baker, thank you very much. Cause you talked about the linseed oil. Um, that's awesome. Nick. Hey, Nick. I'm sorry. I did not make the meeting true, um, but I am going to make it to the AMPS meeting tomorrow. So I'm really excited for that. Uh, I don't know, Nick, if you've uh, looked at the AMPS meeting, but that would be very, very cool. Um, Evan. Hey, how's it going, Evan? Evan is a patron. Thank you very much for coming in. Um, it's really cool to see you. I had to get some of my lemon juice there. Uh, Mark, did you get the copper wire from Vetco? No, I got the copper wire, excuse me, from Amazon. And um, it was it was really about gauge. I was looking for that thickness. And for this stuff, I did it when I did three wooden sailboats. And, and that's the wire that I used. Excuse me, I'm dry again, even though my juice, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, John Robeck, if you remove the BG objects, the auto folks will. Yeah, there you go. <clears throat> I have too much background and it's trying to pick that stuff up, apparently. <clears throat> and I got a cough anyway. This is what happens when I talk forever. My throat just totally locks up. Maybe um, somebody's trying to tell me something. Thank you very much. Um uh, John, so John works and, and knows a little bit about, you know, production and stuff like that. So I took that stuff out of there. That should help. Um, <clears throat> especially the bright objects. There you go. Yeah. I was probably just like killing myself with that. So anyway, if you're going to do that strap after it's all painted up and stuff, um, I put it on there and, you know, checked it out. And then I broke something else off. But what I found was I didn't prepare my wire well enough and paint was chipping off of it. 
off the little hook and, and, and stuff like that. So that's what I was talking about before. One of the things I didn't show you is sometimes what I'll do with these is after I get them, um, uh, you know, bent up and stuff like that, I will just anneal it myself. One of the things it does is if there is an impurity on the metal or, or sometimes what they'll do is you'll get wire that's coated and it has a plastic, um, please be careful. Don't breathe in any of the smoke. Maybe do it outside or something like that. But you're just kind of burning that stuff off. That's the first step I do. The second thing I'll do is I will put it um, in vinegar. Now, vinegar is a pretty strong acid. And, and so it will etch like a lot of the soft metals. And so that's what I actually did with the chain and the copper that I have off of the back of Carlos's suit. So <clears throat> here's Carlos's suit, and this is his side of that toe strap deal. And what I did there was I kind of bent everything up. I got everything the way I wanted. I used chain, and then I made some circles just for everything where it joined. And then I took the whole mess, and I put it in some vinegar. Now... You can use electro, you know, where you put the electrical probes and stuff. I don't know how to do that yet. So I didn't go that route because by doing that, you can really get a reaction with certain chemicals and acids and all that kind of stuff. I'm not doing that. I don't know how to do that yet. But just the vinegar did do a real good job on etching the surface so that it didn't have any kind of plating. Well, I mean, I don't think it's going to go through nickel, but I mean, it it got through whatever was on the surface of that chain and got through whatever's on the surface of that copper and it made it much better for, uh, you know, receiving paint and paint sticking to it. Because if it's too uh, smooth and stuff like that, sometimes you hit it, boom, chips right off. Moving back and forth to a show, just showing stuff to, to people, you just knock stuff right off of it. So make sure you prep your wire. Sometimes, where's that little piece of wire? Sometimes what I'll do is I'll just take some steel wool to it, you know, rough it up just like you would think. Take a little steel wool to it, maybe take some fine emery board, whatever, one of your sanding sticks, run that around it a couple times, that works great. I don't like doing that because I've done it and not hit everywhere. Um, and so I like it on one side, it's like, you know, you prep everything and you think it's all, you know, we're good. Didn't work. So that's why I like doing it with just vinegar. Vinegar does a pretty darn good job on copper and, and a lot of metals. Won't do it all for all of them, but it works pretty darn good. Um, if it's warm, it's better. I wouldn't boil it, but what I do is, um, I just take a small amount of it, um, stick it in the microwave, uh, very short amount of time. It just warms it up and throw it in there. Boom works. Leave it in there for an hour and, and it works great. So that's how I do it. So I think now I think I'd take care of all the questions. If anybody has questions about it, please ask. Um, I didn't really talk all that much about my, uh, what I did in the um, applying the oils and, and before we start doing the next demo, cause that's what we're ready for. I just want to show you this because these were important. Um, the brushes that I used for chipping and doing oils were the same, well, almost the same. And the chipping brush was a 5 aught XDT 725. And then there's some really, really beautiful um, Japanese or Chinese or Korean, I'm sorry, I'm not sure, uh, writing on there. And I mean no disrespect, I really can't tell. Um, but this is a great brush and I really like it. So it is uh, a 5 aught XDT 725. It was a great brush, uh, held up through all of it. And I will burn through a brush on a project. I have not learned to, you know, best practices. I hear these guys like, I've had this brush for 15 years. I'm like, I'm really, that's where I'd love to get to. I ain't there yet. I've got soaps and everything and I just need to be a lot more careful. Um, and then the second one, this was great. It was a very inexpensive brush. It is a um, makeup brush and we bought a pack. My wife bought a pack of these guys and it was great. It was really nice to go ahead and blend the oil on the surface of both Carlos and Ichiro. 
So I just wanted to mention those brushes. I thought I forgot and I did. So I wanted to hit that. So now we are going to do some surface work. Now, surface work is, is kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm doing okay. And then I do something like I did this week and I saw Boomer Diorama's latest video. If you haven't seen Boomer Diorama, please go and look up Boomer Diorama. Person is brilliant. The gentleman that does this worked in the movie industry, knows, you know, an awful lot. It was a suggestion for me. You know, one of you suggested it to me and I went and saw him. Wow. Just totally blown away. So I think the first part of, you know, me doing a diorama has been in a lot of stuff that we've talked about is story, right? Because the story for me is the plan that's kind of guides us through the whole diorama and, and, and having a strong story and helps you kind of figure out where you're going to put stuff and what's going to enhance the story and all that. So I've, I've been going on and on and on and on and on about that. Well, now it's really start talking about serious details, serious skills. And that's why I mention um, Boomer Diorama. This gentleman has great skills and presents in, in a way that is, is really nice and takes you through the whole process. Something that I'm trying to do much better. You know, the, the fact that I'm doing demos each Friday now, that was a direct result of having a conversation with Mr. Uh, Rick Lawler. And I had a chance to talk to him earlier at the show. And it was awesome. And I then dug it. And he said, yeah, do more demos. Show people what you're doing. Well, I'm doing that. Boomer Diorama has been doing it forever and has some great stuff there. So I'm going to now really start focusing more on, I think I do okay terrain. I'm going to work harder and harder and harder at it. So I want to do more complex terrains. The terrains I've been doing have been relatively simple, right? Um, bombed out war zones, deserts, things like that. I want to really get into terrains. And so that's what's coming. But for now, we're going to look at this. So I'm all set up here and we are going to show how I put my kits, my models that I've done, right? Each your own Carlos on the surface, because if I just put them on there, come on, I've got to put tracks I've got to make sure it looks like they've interacted with that surface. I don't want it to look like they're just there. So this is how we're going to do it. And I'm going to, I'm going to get you on the other camera so uh, you can see it. And this, this should look a heck of a lot better too. Um, so here, see, I think um, I'm going to clear some other stuff out of here too. Uh, but there you go. So that's muy besser. So, um, there's some preparation that I did earlier this week to get it this way. Now, let's take it all the way back. The base, this is made from styrofoam, okay? It was carved. I prefer to carve my styrofoam uh, with a, a rotary tool. And then I put Mod Podge on it, and then I put sanded grout. And the sanded grout... Uh, there's a process to that. We're going to go through that completely today. So you're going to know it very well. Um, that hardens with the sanded grout and the Mod Podge together. And it gives us a really nice service. But it's just a start. It's I leave these little, little imperfections. I know of people, and, and, and for very good reasons, they will filter their sanded grout as it's being poured on the surface. And it makes a very clean, clean and and, and beautiful surface. And then they add everything to it. I like a little bit more rougher surface. And so I, a lot of times will just sprinkle it on and I'll sprinkle it on with this. I just literally scoop it. Here is what our sanded grout looks like. So I placed it in a different container. It's just a little bit easier to work with, of course. And so it is just very sandy. You don't want to dive into this stuff because it is, um, uh, it'll become airborne very quickly. I don't know what the term for that is, but the stuff will poof like a son of a gun. So be really careful about it. I'm going to bring this out a little bit, please. There we go. So now, um, uh, I don't want this on my computer either. So this is the sanded grout. And if I just add water to this, it'll set up. 
you know, it's, it's a mortar, right? But I want to put the Mod Podge in it because there's other properties that I want out of that Mod Podge. The Mod Podge will seal the surface. If I just put this on here with water, you know, they tell you when you use grout for tile to put a sealer over it after the fact, right? Well, I'm sealing it while I do it because if I put, uh, th this has the foam underneath it. If I put a solvent type, uh, like a wash or something like that, it's possible that it could degrade the foam underneath by putting Mod Podge and water in the mix that I use for this, that I'm sealing it and it doesn't allow that to happen. So that's just one of the things I do. I also seal the top of it with Mod Podge in the process. And we're gonna look at that today. Now, the other thing that we've looked at that I did in preparation for today was I had a gap. So you remember between this and here, there was a small gap because this was separate from this piece. So this week, what I did was first off in here, I glued the base of the geodesic dome to this. So it's permanently on there now. Can't take it off. The second thing I did, and I, and I filmed this stuff to show, uh, you know, later on in long, long form videos, but um, I traced the background here and then I painted that opaque. So what happened was previously I had only this very light, you can kind of see through it, dusting of XF 59 desert yellow. I think that's what it is. Um, I only had a light dusting. And so if I would have done what I did here, you would have seen it. So I had to first paint that opaque. So I just used the same paint, but that is all opaque now. So now it looks like the dirt has come right up on these windows, right? Didn't look like that before. The second thing I did was I filled in that gap and I used this material. So now this material is the, uh, it's basically paper pulp, water, Mod Podge, and one or two drops of bleach. And, and what I use this for is packing material. The Mod Podge is the glue. The water makes it so you can handle it. Um, I take paper towels. I put them in a blender. They chop up really, really good. So it's the consistency of oatmeal. And then I put a little bleach in there so nothing wacky grows in it because it looked like it was going to come out of this thing and attack me. So after um, I put a little bleach in there, that killed every, all, every microbe or alien, whatever it was, and gave me this. So this is just wood pulp, well, paper pulp, which is wood pulp, and um, Mod Podge and water. And what I'm able to do then is I took it yesterday, I did this yesterday morning, and just put it all along there. I didn't have to stuff the whole thing full of it. I just went ahead and put it at the top. And you can see that here. Right here is that little white dot, Let's see if I can get closer, that little white dot, that is uh, the paper pulp. This is all open here, that's a gap. You won't see it in the final model. Um, that's an open gap. Well, that then, what I did was I bridged the gap and then I tried to give me a surface that now today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put sand, more sanded grout on that, and it's gonna look like it's just come right up to the surface of our um, geodesic dome, which is the look we want. So because the geodesic dome uh, has been sitting idle for a couple, if not three years, the issue being it's not been maintained, it's not been taken care of, and so dirt's coming up to it, um, and quite a bit. You know, here's the, the, the base of, uh, on that side, here's the base on that side. This is how much dirt has you know come up against this in the last two to three years so there's been a lot of uh you know uh, drifting sand whatever the case so what i'm going to do is first uh because what we're doing is going to work on this base but we also need to know exactly where we're going to be putting our figures because we're going to put in footsteps and we're going to put in a track for the wheel of each row so i'm gonna come here and you can mark with whatever you want to mark with but again i want to be really cautious about 
anything that's going to interact. I don't necessarily want to mark with an ink. I don't know how thick I'm going to put stuff here. It's probably going to be fine, but just think of those things. Even pencil lead can interact with alcohol. Um, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of your stuff will uh, uh, pencil will come off with alcohol. So that means alcohol interacts with it. That means that if I put some on top of it, it's possible that it could bleed through. And I will be using alcohol in this. So I got a little drip in there. I want to get rid of that because I don't want to put any marks on it. But what I've got here is earlier this week, I also drilled into the bottom of Carlos's left foot. And I mounted a wire and this is um, welding wire. So it's really hard, really stiff and it's not going anywhere. And that is going to go right next to a hole. That hole is for the electronics of Carlos to go through down to the control board and the base. Um, I don't have to worry about putting that in right now. What I really am concerned about is where I'm going to have my figure on the surface because I'm not going to be adding this material while he's there. I only want to add the material around where he's going to be. So I'm just going to come in here and mark just as you think you might. Where his feet are. I don't necessarily have to draw around them. I don't want to get anything on them. Um, all I'm going to do is give basically their boundaries. There'll be plenty of time to hard mount them after I've done the work. And the work that I'm interested in is footprints and, and a track for the wheel of Ichiro. So now here's Ichiro. And yes, it would be great to have both figures in here, but I know where they are. Typically you would want to do that. Now I have to look at the attitude of Ichiro's wheel here, you know, make that a consideration. Um, and then I'm just gonna come straight back. You know, maybe a, a little curve. And it's just rough. Here I'm gonna have like some drag marks. And that's it. I, I don't, you know, I have done this before where I'm doing a tank, right? And I'm doing the tank and I want to get the tracks in here. So what I'll do then is I'll put down the same surface. I'll put some of it, the same kind of surface down wet, or sometimes I'll use an acrylic uh, mud or texture like this Vallejo. Um, and then I'll put that down and then I'll put my model right in it. I think that's a fine way to do it. But what I prefer is to use a tool or extra tracks because a lot of times there's extra tracks or even before you put your tracks on. And the reason I like to do that is I can initially, you know, bring them in and, and, and do this stuff. Now that's not how it's gonna be on the vehicle. The vehicle, it's gonna be probably more straight, right? And so if you try to put that in, it's not gonna leave it a, a, an indentation. So if I'm going to put this in, I'm going to use the track and I'm going to kind of press that in. The other consideration is what if it's a really difficult model? I don't want to take this and press it into some acrylic mud or whatever textured, you know, earth substance I've got down here. So there's a couple of things that you can do. Number one, when I'm using this, I will use this and I will sprinkle um, uh, sand over it. And why don't we just look at a simple uh, demonstration of that because I think it's it's a really nice way to do it and it's not going to mess up um, your model that way because it just won't stick. So what I do is I'll get a little bit of this and I'm, I'm pretty sure I got some sand over here. So there is my mud. And I'm just going to kind of get it down here where I'm going to try to get some tracks in here. So you see this a lot. F people will take that and then you take this. Now, one way to do it is just spray it with water. And that works great, you know, and, 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 and not a lot will get on here. But what I like to do is I like to use sand. And 
Well, I don't, I don't have any fine sand. So what I'll use is just this. So here you're going to have a color difference, but this powder, right? This is the sanded grout that I'm putting on there. Sorry, my big old head was in the way. By just putting a little bit of that powder on there, look what happens. Didn't really stick my trash a little bit on there. Yeah, so I could have done better. But look at that. You've still got all your track marks just by having a little bit of that. And that's, you know, probably going to, you know, work great. If you don't want all the powder on there, tap the powder off. You still got just fantastic track. So that's one way to do it. I'm not doing that today, but I just wanted to show you how to do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build up that stuff directly on here without the model involved because I don't want to take a chance on getting some of this stuff on the model itself. Okay, so that's what I'm doing. So let me get the stuff out of the background. And the first thing we're going to do are tracks. Uh, to get here, you know, when you walk up to something, you don't necessarily just step, 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 step. You know, there's oft times a lot of milling. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little area here where there's going to be some milling, and then I'm going to have tracks coming in from here. Because you don't just walk up and just plant. Typically, you don't. So I'm going to do that first. -us. I'm using my 50-50 um, cut of Mod Podge because I don't want to build up a super thick, you know, heavy amount. I like the, the texture I have here. Everything else is, is set to be there. So I'm just going to slowly build up a little bit where I'm going to have some tracks, okay? So a little bit of this on here, just like that. And I'm just going to brush it around. Um, I don't have to get crazy with this stuff. Oh, that brush is like all seized up. That's pretty good. I'm just going to do this. I can still see my marks through there. It's not a big deal. Because what I want in here is a little milling around area. And up here, I only need a couple of tracks. You know, Ichiro is going to be up here. So I don't need a heck of a lot. So now... Where's my water? Here's my water. I'm going to bring this in. And in this instance, remember I said a lot of times I just dump it on because I want the rough. Well, right now I've kind of got my terrain. I don't want to mess that up. So I am going to use a, a little screen. And so one of the tools, sorry, I'm just closing this mud up. One of the things I use is just a little screen like this. Okay. And so I take my stuff. And I don't just like dump a bunch of stuff in there. I kind of get over the area I want and I, I slowly, you know, bring this stuff in. Now, all this is doing is just giving me a little bit of a base and a little bit of a place to start putting more of this because I'm going to make like sunken in track marks. And this is just making it nice so it's going to adhere really, really well when I get it. So now we move to this guy here. And I'm going to bring in a fair amount of this. And I'm going to make a paste. And I do this a lot. The, the, uh, like when I'm, when I'm doing stuff inside, I'll, I'll be doing more of this. But making a paste with this um the water the mod podge and stuff like that really works well i'm trying to get the background here like john was saying it's just like it's like a mess back here but now this paste will work really well and you just apply it with a brush and it helps me make the ridges and the little things to the sides of the footsteps where I'm going to have. Now, I did kind of lose my steps here. I didn't think I would, but that's what I'm doing. Now, the other thing about working with this is I personally don't leave it wet. Like, like see where I'm putting this stuff in, where I'm going to just have a bunch of, like you're kicking sand around, right, with your feet as you're. 
setting this stuff in. I'm not going to leave this where it's just going to have this wet sanded grout. Just like I did with the tracks and just like I did here, I'm going to sprinkle more of this over the top. And what that does is it gives me a really nice dry idea of what it's going to look like and lets me work with it even more. It kind of pulls the, it pulls that, that moisture up. So there's that. Now I'm going to come back here and get this ridge for each row where he's kind of kicked up a little bit of this, again, soft sand. Okay. And then I'm going to have a couple of tracks up here. This is going to be underneath Ichiro, but I think it'll work out real nice. This, I think I need one back here. Now this looks just like putty, but what's going to happen is when I put dry on it and start forming it, that one was a lump. You're going to see the little steps that I make. And I don't have to use my model. Where's my other brush? There it is. Okay, so same kind of deal. I'm just going to do it with my fingers. It's easier. And here's where we're going to push up those little ridges. This one. So here, this is where he's stepping. I'm just really easy coming in here and look at, I can get real nice controlled work with this stuff. It's not as random as you might want to think. It's a heck of a lot more controlled when you do it like this. Now around his feet, I also want to kind of give a little different color when I paint it. So I'm looking at that as well. I want to think about how I'm going to paint and contour all of this. Because you shade your ground just like you would shade anything else in your, uh, in your diorama. You know, just like your model, you've got to treat the ground effects. You've got to treat the things that you add just like any other element that you're adding to your diorama. See those, those footsteps are just kind of appearing there. So I'm just pushing out from that center and giving it a little bit of little ridge. I got a little wet there. Um, I like working with this because it's some, oh, there's some stuff underneath. So I'm going to break it up because it's something that is so versatile that I keep finding things to do with it. And, and that's my favorite type of material, right? Uh, I started doing this with it and it's like, oh, and I can do that too. That to me is like just your, your total bonus. So these tracks are just kind of, you know, coming right up to it. I think I can have another one here. That one needs to go away. Oh, I got one more up here I want to do. I'm just pushing from the inside. And once I got that, I kind of, I want to come out here. And this is a lot of water, but I think it'll be okay. Now we're going to do Ichiro's track. Now this actually has to be kind of thin. And I'm sorry, I'm not even looking at the comments, folks. Um, but I will check here in just a second. 
but this I want to be kind of just like this really thin, but I want it in this little gully. I want it to be kind of like it, it got a little stuck. You know what I mean? A little justification for the strap that we got on the, on the front of Ichiro and the back of Carlos. Okay. I think that looks pretty good. I'm going to break this down a little more. I'm trying to get this milling look, right? You're you're trying to find the best place to look. You're trying to, you know, get in there and see what's going on. Because what's happened here is he's come up on this and he doesn't know from a distance, hey, is everything okay? Then as he gets closer, he can maybe see, oh no, it's not okay. It's broken down a little bit. And so that's that's what's going on you know I, I don't know that you're going to come right up to the place you're going to look into and just look in i think maybe you're looking around a little bit so there we go so now i've got some milling around i've got some footsteps in here now that's going to get rock hard right these footsteps are going to get rock hard so not now it's too wet i'm going to get stuff on my model but before it does finally get rock hard i will put them in here and take a look so the next thing I'm going to concentrate, because I like this. I like how these are looking. I want to get a little thinner here maybe on, on each row. But I also want to talk more. Oh, that's a footstep. Sorry. I want to talk more about how the sand is also coming up to the geodesic dome. So that's the, you know, the stuff that we put on there yesterday. Now that I've got a completely different idea for. That... I mean, I'm going to use the same material and we're going to sprinkle it on there, but I do want to sprinkle it by hand like I did. Um, it, it, it's not going to matter if it gets up here. It's going to be fine, but I got to wet it a little bit and then sprinkle on that stuff. And then I'm going to tap it away, right? I don't want to build up a lot there. So we're going to take some just plain Mod Podge and water. I'm going to get a little cup here. It's not want to go everywhere. And now I'm just going to paint it on there and get it ready to take on some of this sanded grout. Now, when I put this on here, I, I did film it so you'll be able to see um, in a later video. It does shrink a little bit. I love this stuff because it's almost like a cellulose that you don't have to buy. But it does shrink a little bit. So you have to be cautious of that, you know. And and I like, you know, using new materials and stuff, but, you know, put them through their paces. I also am constantly learning, so, uh, you know, what it's capable of and what it does. And that's totally fine. But it's nice to know before you commit it to something that you're like, really, hey, this is like a, my... You know, this is going to the show or I've got one shot at this. So, you know, take your time. So I'm just sprinkling this stuff on. This, I want to get on there. I want to get it so it's hitting all of the places along the base, but I'm going to tap it away. And I do that a lot. Um, some stuff I'll leave. And, and, and when I'm done with where it's at, what I'll do is I'll spray it with um, the alcohol. And, and we'll probably do that here a little bit on the tracks when I get back to the tracks, but this, I just want to tap away. So I only want to get enough on here to cover it. And it is right. I don't necessarily want this stuff on there. I may want some later. I don't want it now. So now I'm just going to tap the thing away. Okay. Now I'm going to take it over my garbage and get the rest of it away. There we go. So now only the stuff that's right on top of the white is catching that stuff. But it's a nice transition. That's what I wanted. This stuff, it's settled down a little bit. I'm going to get my track a little bit better there for each euro. But this is settled down. I'm going to now dust these with this and... I don't want to go a lot because all I want to do is basically 
pull the remaining moisture into the stuff that I'm getting over it, because that's what's happening here, and not change the, the texture. Just give it a little bit more so it isn't smooth. You know, if you have too much moisture on this stuff, you'll get like the smooth, you know, like maybe it's squishing out from underneath a, a, a tire, which is okay. Doesn't work bad at all. But for this, they're walking. So I want more of a rougher texture. So when I'm sprinkling this on here, I'm getting a nice rough texture over that. Um, this is the fun thing about using a material over a long time. You get a chance to get used to it. I, I like trying new stuff, certainly. But when you get used to how it, it works and, and the properties that you discover along the way, you can do some really fun stuff to it. So now I think, can you see those tracks? I, I can see them now. The, the light's working well for me. You see there's a little bit of you know, rummaging around there. You've got Ichiro's track is pretty tight there. Uh, it's pulling that that moisture out of it. So yeah, I am pretty happy with that. So once it sets up a little bit, before we're done, I'll be able to do it. Once it sets up a little bit, we'll be able to set them in there and, and, and really get uh, a good look at it. But uh, I'm liking how it's looking so far. So I'm going to wipe my hands here real quick. And I would like to look at some comments because some cool people just got in. Everybody else is cool here too. But some other cool people got in here today and we're going to see who it is. So Josh says, hello. Hello, Josh. I'm going to go back up. Evan, we said hello to. Thank you, Evan, for coming in. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, moving back through these, but that's okay. Mark Doremus asked if I got the... Um, the copper wire from Vetco. Nope, but Amazon works pretty good. If you remove the beat, yep, thank you very much. The background objects, I think here, distilled white vinegar. Did you use jewelry chain on Carlos? Yes, thanks, John. So yeah, distilled white vinegar is what I use. I, I think you can get even like stronger vinegars because like when you're doing distilled white vinegar, um, it's it's still broken down. It's There's water in there. Uh, so it's not full on vinegar. Um, but yeah, that's what I used. And then um, the jewelry chain, different chains, you know, you have to be careful about those jewelry chains because some of them are figured. And, you know, I had one that I thought it was awesome and it was like a great link and then a weird link and then a great link. And, you know, so like every other link was like weird. And it's like, that's not, you know, what I'm looking for. Uh, but yeah, those chains work great. Josh, thank you very much for coming by. I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, if I could paint, sorry to say, but we can't really see what you're doing. We need an overhead view. I think you're right if I could paint. I, you know, I did build an overhead view, but I don't have the right lens for it. So I'm still working on that. So I'm, I'm very sorry about that. I'm going to continue to work on it. I got a really cool mount and you can see, well, I could, I could show you, I guess. But yeah, I, I just, I haven't got the right lens yet. But I'm working on it, sir. Sorry about that if I could paint. Hey, Nick, how's it going? Uh, you could get silicone and mold maker and resin or clay, make a copy of the wheels and feet, make footprints. Track. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea. But, you know, for a one-off, though, you know, here's, here's something to really consider. This is a really interesting thing that Nick is talking about here. When I'm building a, a, a diorama, when you're building a diorama, when you're building your model and stuff like that, you put a lot of time in it, right? And then you think like what Nick is suggesting, maybe that's too much time. But then I thought about it. I was like, no, it's not. For the, all the stuff I do, you know, I might work an entire day, which I just about did on that strap, right? For each euro. And I'm thrilled with it because I think it came out very well. And I think it, it adds to... Not only the story, because it supports the story, but it also supports uh, everything else to do with, you know, the diorama. So to take a day and do silicone molds and all that kind of stuff, because it would take about a day, would be perfect. So I like that idea. And then you could have them in there while you're doing it and then just virtually lift them out. Because I do want a little bit about, you know, seating, right? When you're putting your model on your diorama, it needs to be seated in there. That was the whole point about, you know, using the track. 
if I just use the model and it's stretched tight and I get it in there, it's in, in any undulations of the, of the ground, you're going to miss that stuff sticking in. So what I like to do is use that track, even if it's showing and it's, and it's bridging over that when the real vehicle is there, cause that can happen. I've still got track there because when the first part of the track went over, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, you want to seat that thing in there and make it look right. If you made a, uh, a copy of what you're trying to seat and use that, that would work great. Uh, zoom in, please. Hi, Josh. Sorry, boy. I'm telling you guys, I'm just messing the whole thing up. There's Josh and Rick. Hey, thanks very much, Rick, for coming in. You know, the, the reason I'm doing demos is the conversation that I had with Rick at the, um, at the uh, uh, IPMS Seattle Spring Show. Um, he was like, you know, hey, you've gone through this. And I mentioned this earlier in this in the broadcast, but uh, he's like, yeah, that would make a, a, a big difference. And so thank you very much, Rick. I really, really appreciate that. And saying hi to Rick and Josh and crap work calls. Got to go. Sorry uh, about that, Mark. And see, I just keep going on and on. So anyway, um, that's how I do this. And. As you can see, it doesn't take long for this start to set up. I can see a lot of scuffing around. I can see some footprints in there. There's a good view. You can see where Ichiro came down. You can see another footprint up high. And that's what I want. I don't want it to be too, uh, you know, exact or something like that. But I definitely want it to look like I've, I've, I've come through the area, right? And, and these are actual footprints. So now it's, I think I'm going to try to seat this thing. Um, here is Carlos and I've got to be really careful with Carlos and I do not care. Just, this is me. I've done it before where I've put, um, you know, uh, perfect footprints and stuff like that. But for the other footprints, I do not care if they're exact footprints and sand aren't exact. I think these are great. They look good to me. But these, I want these feet to be making proper contact with the ground. So that's what I'm going to do here. To help this so that it's not going to, you know, mess up your model. Um, if you've sprayed it, if you're using acrylics, you might want to be careful. This is all, you know, set up and, and all good. I'm going to put a little bit of water on there. I'm just going to, you know, brush it with water. It's going to help it not stick so much. Again, the powder, uh, you could even use talcum powder. I, I have talcum powder. Um, because the talc will, by powdering the bottom of your feet, won't stick to really anything. Um, and it's not really that hard to get off your model, but water works okay. Uh, it's not that big a deal. I'm going to be here. If you should get some of this stuff on your model, you do want to get it off now. You do not want to let it dry. If it does, it'll mess it up. Okay, so I'm going to come in here and I got to get everything right where it's at. And now what I'm doing is I'm trying to seat it. And by seating it, I'm actually putting those feet in and getting them exactly where they can go. See, I got to do a little bit of work there. I'm going to come back here. Yep, everything looks good on there. Nothing stuck. But it did show me I got to get a little bit more there. I didn't want to bring that in so far. Well, maybe I could. Yeah. So that gets me my feet where they're going to go. And they're nice and flat. I like it. Later on, when I, I set them in completely, I may um, put in a little bit more, but I don't think so. Um, I don't want too much on there. I want this contour. I want this to be as rough as possible. So now we do each row. Now, each row, I'm going to do a little bit of a, get some water on there. I'm going to do a little bit of a slide in here so I can get the roll. And I've got others of these tires, so it's not like a big deal because I can use another tire here if I needed. There we go. And I think I'm going to bring a little bit more up here, just adjust it a little bit because I want this to be closer to his tire. I can already feel underneath. It's starting to get uh, the mound I put here. It's starting to get real solid. So it does not take long for this stuff to set up. 
And then before I finish here, I will sprinkle a little bit more because when I touch it here, it's kind of like making mud pies. Uh, brings the uh, it brings the uh, water to the surface, and it'll make it smooth. So just a little dusting will again bring back the rough texture. There we go. I like it. Okay. So that is uh, the sand. You know, we're trying to tell a story here, right? And, and part of the story is that this thing got just mauled. I mean, you know, the, the, uh, I'm going to go with like a meteor shower. That, that seems like it works. So this thing got messed up. It also had all this dirt come in later on after that. So nobody's been maintaining it. What I'm trying to think about is what kind of debris might be outside and not just from this dome, but also just in general, you know, the, the, there's work, you, you have stuff outside the facility, you know, when you're putting it up together. So that, so that stuff has to be integrated. And because this, this dirt came in and, and drifted in later, it's got to be integrated into the dirt. Right. So that's one of the things that I'll be working on this week. Now that I've got where everybody's going to be, I've, I've got them, you know, seated where they're going to sit. Um, I'm probably like I put a wire on the bottom of Carlos's foot. I most likely will drill into the bottom of here and maybe even here and here and set some pins and drop them in just for secure purposes. You know, it, it, it helps. Um, these things are going to be relatively delicate. And if you're taking it to a show, it's going to make a lot of sense. Um, now, one of the last things uh, that I would do on this one is maybe add some rock. Now, I thought about having grass or something like that. I'm not going to go that route for a very specific reason. The storyline that we're following and adapting here is that there is going to be grasses, and I'm going to bring this out. Sorry, folks, I, I had zoomed in. Um, uh, I am going to be adding some plant life inside. So that plant life has to be able to work outside. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have plant life coming up through the, the fractured geodesic dome and then starting to grow on the outside. So I don't want anything over on this side to show, look, it's desolate. There's nothing that can grow, blah, blah, blah. But because of what happened within the geodesic dome and the chemicals and, and, and all they brought to this world, the plant life now is taking hold and then is, is, is coming out. So over here, inside here, and in the bottom of the diorama, there will be plants. And I think, like I said last week, I'm, I'm thinking fungi is, is the number one thing I'm going to work on, but there's got to be something green too. So I, I will be doing that. Um, so I want to check comments, but I think we're, we're just about there. We're just about an hour and a half. And I, I just want to make sure that I've, I've caught everybody's comments and everybody's questions. Um, silicone mode. Great. Zoom in. We got that. Howdy, Rick. There's Rick, Josh. Mark Doremus, got to go. And then Paul, Christopher, thanks very much, Paul. Good evening, fellow modelers. Yeah, I'm just, man, I hate this. I'm, I'm just about done, Paul. But, you know, if you have any questions, please do ask. Uh, you know, we did uh, the demo. We looked at my oil painting. Uh, I'm going to switch the camera again, folks, so that uh, you can see my mug. Uh, that's not the camera. This is the camera. There we go. Um Perfect. So yeah, I mean, that was kind of the demo um, and, and how to get your groundwork and, and, and get it going. I have done it in the way where I don't do any groundwork and I do all my groundwork at once. And I don't prefer to do it that way. You know, when I'm building a diorama, it really is kind of a, um, not a step-by-step -step because that implies I know where I'm going because I don't a lot of times I have that idea and I build that story and that, that story changes along the way. So I like to have in my dioramas, the ability to make changes. So I'll do something 
just to get it where I think it needs to be. And then I know there's other things I'm going to be adding to it later on. I kind of give myself an out, right? I give myself the ability to make a change. So I'm not destroying something that I really put a lot of work into if the story changes just a little bit. So I try to be kind of loose with how I set stuff up. But because of that, I do want to start my groundwork early on, like I did before. I got the basic idea, right? And now I'm coming back as the story's developed. You know, when I first did this groundwork, Ichiro was not necessarily a part of it. Consider that. So there was going to be something up here. Now that Ichiro is part of it, I can go back put his tracks in, put Carlos's tracks in. So it's just, it's, it's not necessarily a plan. It's not like you should do it this way because what I'm telling you is I'm not giving you a plan. I'm just trying to say by being a little bit looser, by being able to make changes along the way when you get a great idea, then I think you'll have or, or be able to adapt a little bit better when you great, get those great ideas and maybe, ah, I'm not going to do it because it doesn't follow the plan, right? Follow those great ideas. Try to dive in, you know, make those changes along the way. I certainly do. And I build with that ability. That's why a lot of times my stuff is not fully assembled before I go in and start, you know, doing that finished stuff. I leave myself room to, to get to everything because the story could change. Um, I got a question or a comment here. Uh, John, very cool techniques. Thanks, Bill. I hope so. I, I've got to really figure out this camera angle thing. I'm struggling. I thought I had it a long time ago, but that was for like filming long form videos. Now that I'm doing the live stream and I'm going to do a demo every week of some sort of diorama building, of course, I've got a little bit different way of doing that. I, you know, I got to set the cameras up different. I did, and, and it would be ridiculous for me to try to show you right now, but I've got this deal where I've got a down shot available. It's, it's getting the right camera. And, and I've got the right camera. I just, I got to get the right lens. And it, it, I got to get everything dialed in. So it's going to look a lot better. Thank you very much. Um, Scott, uh, I was paying attention and listening so I could learn valuable ideas. Thank you, Bill, for sharing your skills and knowledge. Wow, thanks very much, Scott. That was so nice. Um, I hope I am. It is really important for me to get these ideas across. I want to get something out there valuable so that you keep coming back and I can keep telling you how I do stuff. It's that simple. So I hope I'm giving you good information. If something's not right, tell me. I really appreciate it if I could paint when you said, look, I can't see, I got to get that down. You know, I'm working on that. I'm going to get it because I want you to get something out of this. I love doing this. And if you love doing it too, maybe we can share some ideas. So I'm going to go back because I really want to go through the last slide or slides uh, here. And um, because I want to say thank you very much to my patrons. Um, it's, it's really cool. The, the patrons, because what we do is um, we just talk modeling and we talk technique and we talk about trying to, you know, get better. I'm, I'm a constant learner. You know, uh, I, we've talked about that a lot. And when I'm interested in something as much as I am in dioramas, it is fun uh, to, to see. So this is I wanted to show this picture because I forgot earlier. Um, so John Hayes, uh, last week had said, and, and I tried to say this earlier and I just totally flubbed it up. Um, you know, can you use the Mod Podge and water to make your, your material stiffer? And I said, no, because I use other stuff. Well, this is what I did. That's where I hung it up and, and it worked great. And I'm going to use it every time now. So that was, 
you know, uh, uh, a person that enjoys looking or watching the show, give me a great idea and other people have as well. And I certainly appreciate it. My um, patron folks, I certainly appreciate that too, because I talk to you a little bit more regularly than other folks. And it's really great because I get great ideas and I get great feedback and I really do appreciate it. So thank you to my patrons. If you're not a patron, maybe you can take a look at it. It, it helps me keep doing what I'm doing and I really enjoy it. So thank you very, very much, folks. I think we are at the end of it. There we go. That's the end of it. And I really had a great time. Uh, I hope you did too. Please tell me if you didn't. If there's something that's just like completely bonkers, I'm here to hear you because uh, I want to continue to make this better and something that you enjoy coming back to. So if you are a patron, remember, this is the third Friday of the month. So uh, Diorama Friday Night Live is open for all patrons. And that starts at 6 p.m. tonight, goes till 9. I hope you can make it. It should be fun. I'll be working on this, as you might imagine. Uh, but you can work on anything you like. We can talk about anything you like. It's all about dioramas and models. So if you can make it great at about 530, I will be sending out an email to all patrons and uh, then you can join at six. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's a lot of fun. Uh, Mark Duramis, I think you and I, sir, are going to talk at two. So thanks very much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I am having a great Friday. I hope you get outside. But if not, the bench is the second place to be. So have a great one and we'll see you next week. Bye bye.